Hey, Unit 4, Segment 1, um, Global Climate Change. For the resources for this unit, you guys, it's Chapter 21 in your book, but actually your book is not going to be a great resource because it, it didn't have very much on climate change. So I used the EPA, AMS, and NOAA website as well as others to gather the most up-to-date and accurate information I could. Okay, so starting out, um, you can't really understand climate change unless you understand what climate is. So climate is defined as an area's long-term average weather pattern, long-term averages, whereas weather, you guys, is short-term daily or weekly um, patterns. But climate is different than weather in the fact that climate has more of a large frame of time. And so you're looking at averages with that. So what controls climate? I mean, if you were to take a flight and land anywhere on the planet, you would have to pack accordingly to the climate that you're going to be landing in. So if you take any place in the globe, you know, like here over um, in South America or right here in Africa or up here, you know, near the, the pole right here, or anywhere on the planet, if you landed there, you're going to see that there's a whole different set of climate um, <clears throat> controls. And climate, by the way, usually involves <clears throat> average temperature and the average amount of rainfall. There's other things, yes, but those are the two main, main descriptors of climate. So they're controlled by everything as um, like latitude, how far away from the equator is the location, elevation from the ground, so looking at the tops of mountains versus valleys, whether it's nearby water, as in Great Lakes or ocean. Um, we talked in the last unit about how ocean conveys heat and energy. So if it's near that heat source or that cold, cold current, you're going to have cold or warm air, depending. And then the prevailing winds, the global wind patterns, are also going to direct where that air is going to go. Topography, the lay of the land um, matters as well. Is it, is it flat? Is it hilly? Is it mountainous? Um, those all play a role in the kind of climate that you'll find there. Vegetation is kind of cut off on your video, but that's, that says vegetation. And that's surprising to some kids. Forest versus um, like desert or just barren land. Vegetation actually will absorb sunlight and convert it into glucose, which is another store form of energy. So it actually absorbs that energy and doesn't necessarily convert it into heat right away. Whereas like pavement or sand from desert will take it and um, absorb it in and convert it into heat immediately. So you literally are cooler in the forest, not because you're just mostly in the shade, but because also those plants are taking in some of that energy and converting it into glucose, as opposed to letting it um, go back out into the atmosphere as heat immediately. Okay, so now let's get into climate change. That's really the beef of the unit. What is global climate change? Climatic inconsistency. Okay, what the world, Ms. Holton, what does that mean? Climatic inconsistency. That means what was normally um, the average temperature and average precipitation in an area has now changed. And this would be a long-term average. This can be very long-term, like over several thousand years, or it can be somewhat shorter term over a few, you know, tens to hundreds of, of years, but it's climatic inconsistency with the area and what it should be. It's an alteration in the average weather conditions for a particular location on our planet. Um, we can look at a global cooling situation or we can look at global warming. It's like one or the other. And then there's long-term and short-term versions of this. This, unfortunately, is cut off, but this graph right here is showing um, the dates of, I believe it was 1860 to, to the year 2000 on this end. So we're, we're looking at, you know, 140 years, and that's considered short term. And you guys need to understand this graph, so I'm going to walk through it real quick. We've established a zero mark as our standard. The scientists, you know, they may have looked at, um, actually it looks like the difference from six, 1961 to 1990, what were the what was the average climate? They sent that, set that as a zero mark. So then where it deviated from its standard zero mark, if it went below that in temperature, then it looks like it's cooling. Okay, It's in a state of cooling. And then when it creeps up above the standard line, we have 
global warming situation, and then we have cooling, and then we have warming. And you can see in the last 140 years, we have not seen the kind of warming that we're seeing now. Um, this is a short-term example. Another short-term example, you guys, would be like the El Nino or La Nina conditions, and those usually last anywhere from two to, I don't know, six, seven years. So that's considered short-term as well. The next picture I'm going to show you, though, is long-term. So let me explain this graph. Um, you're looking at the zero time frame, which would be present day right now. And then you're going back in time, 50,000 years, 100,000 years, and all the way back to 400,000 years. And we'll talk about how we get that information in class. Like, how, Ms. Wilson, how do you develop a graph that looks like this? Like, what's a graph? You, how do you go 400,000 years back in time? And there are ways. There are things that we can collect on our planet that actually allow us to take a peek back in time. Um, just to give you an example, we have land sediments that we go dig down into the ground and we can go back in time looking at the sedimentation that exists. And we also look at ice cores and such and things like that. So here we're looking at a temperature change from present. So this, we have a zero temperature change right there all the way down to a, a negative 10 degrees Celsius temperature change. And you can see that there's no line in time in the past 400,000 years that we've gone above or less than, I should say, 10 degrees Celsius drop. Then it goes all the way up to 4 degrees Celsius gain. Um, these peaks and valleys, you can see several of them. You got to think in terms of climate and climate change as global warming, global cooling, warming, cooling, warming, cooling. And so you have these very dramatic events, like here's one, here's one, here's one, and then we're in another one right now. And then drops, ice ages. So these would be ice ages down here where the earth was covered in, in ice, not completely covered, but covered, good portion. And so dramatic differences in change in temperatures give us our global warming, global cooling. Now I want you to take a, a look at this though, because from here, so we have 150,000 here. I'm just giving this one as an example. And then we have 100,000 right here. That's a difference of 50,000. Half of that from here to here is going to be 25,000. Half of that spacing is going to be what? 12 and a half thousand, 12.5 thousand years. So when you look at this change from an ice age to the highest global warming situation and the differences in space, we're looking at about at least, um, I would say, close to 15,000 years of time that it took to go from here to here in temperature range, 15,000 years. So when we see these huge peaks, it took time to actually do that, to make that change. And what we're seeing right now in present day is a change. This is actually a dated, it's actually higher than that now. Um, we're seeing that shift happen so much faster than we have seen any time in history. And so humans necess weren't necessarily around here when we went into these past warming situations. So what, what could have caused those? And so we're going to talk about some natural causes that have occurred. But the issue is that these natural processes are still occurring, you know, a regular rhythm. But we now have humans in the picture here present day. And humans are actually, we are emitting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases at an alarming rate. And so the rate at which we're seeing this warming is, is astounding. So that, you guys, is the issue, um, is the rate, really, that is that this global warming is happening. All right, so one of the major benchmarks that you need to cover, you need to know about, are possible causes for climate change. And there are many. And we're going to go through each one. So we have Earth's motions. There, there's certain um, motions that our planet goes through over thousands of years of time that cannot be ignored as to cause um, a cooling and a, and a warming situation. Plate tectonics, we have an active planet, and so our plates are moving, and that will create different things like um, with albedo and with where the snow accumulates and such. Sunspots. Sun activity, actually, we get most of our sun, 99.985% of our energy that comes to our planet is from our sun. And sun spots are actually indicators of high sun activity. So more sun activity, more energy coming across and hitting our planet. Volcanoes, you'll know, um, 
later on. We'll talk about how they can lead to cooling and warming, depending. And then anthropogenic. This is a new word for you. Say it out loud. Anthropogenic. Anthropogenic. Anthropology is the study of humans. Anthro is that human piece to it. Genic is cause. So anthropogenic, human cause. And then there's a couple others that we'll look at. First off, Earth's motions. This is going to produce long-term climate changes because we're looking at long, huge time frames. And the guy that came up with this um, idea that the Earth was going through these motions, his last name is called Milankovitch. And there are three Milankovitch cycles, three things that the Earth is going through that would account for a change in an overall global climate. The Earth's orbit shape, the path it takes around the sun, is actually um, eccentric. Okay, and it varies every 100,000 years, meaning it goes more circular and then gets kind of a squished oval shape and then goes more circular and then gets squished and so on and so on. So if it's squished, there's going to be times in the orbit where we're closer and we're further away, making the seasons more extreme, and that will impact global climate. The Earth actually, um, we do have a tilt. It's about 23.5 right now or so, and that will shift every 41,000 years it will shift go to an extreme of 22.1 degrees tilt all the way up to a 24.5 degrees tilt that's pretty subtle but it's enough to change the um, energy distribution around the planet and the earth's axis of rotation you guys think of a spinning top how you have the rec the actual spin and then the whole top itself is kind of moving around. And I'm going to show you a, a, an image of that in class. But you have this axis of rotation wobble every 23,000 years. And so that elicits a shift in where our Earth is tilted during different seasons. Again, changing the extremity of how much en energy is coming into our system. Friends, look at the, look at the years. So we have 100,000 years, 41,000 years, 23,000 years. And these are three different motions of our earth. Sometimes they line up and match and other times they don't and they cannot be ignored as factors that will change the distribution of energy on the planet. And um, I will show you a video later on. Okay, so here is a graph and we'll probably show you this in class too, but we have the precession, obliquity, eccentricity, all of those things graphed for you right here. And here's what each means. So precession is the wobble, those spinning top. And then obliquity you know, and extremes are here where they're getting bigger and then smaller. We have these different extremes. We have now across the top all the way back to, um, and this is in thousands, so this would be 200,000. This would be a million years ago. And we can extrapolate that information based on the motion of the objects now. So we can just move, take what we see now and extrapolate that back in time. The obliquity is the tilt, so that's here. Tilt shift 22.1 to 24.5. And then the eccentricity of the orbit, okay, fluctuates, becomes more circular and more oval, and these are marking the extremes, the drop, the top, the drop, the top, and those mark extremes of between the 22.1 and the 24.5. Solar forcing is the sun activity. This would be your sun spots. So how active is the sun? The extremes are going to be the up and downs, okay? And there's a nice little pattern. And then this, you guys, which is partly cut off, you have stages of ice ages. So ice age right here, global warming here. Ice age, global warming. Ice age, global warming. Ice age, global warming. And so each peak is a is an, uh, global warming situation. Each dive is an ice age. Try to see if you can see a trend at all. Like if I follow this peak up of global warming, I also have a peak of solar forcing or sun energy or sunspots. I also have a peak in eccentricity. Not so much going on here with obliquity, but I do have a little bit of a peak here in precession. If I pick another one, um, like an ice age, like maybe this one right here, this is an ice age, you go up and you see a drop in the solar energy, you see a drop in eccentricity, not much shift here in obliquity, but you see a major drop in the precession. So each of these graphed this way allows you to, you know, match apples to apples what's going on over time with all of these variables. And you can't, you can't ignore them as factors that would definitely impact the climate in a global way of our planet. And this is where we're going to stop segment one.